So this talk is uh, about Bayesian thinking. Uh, it won't be mathematically, or at least I have reduced as much as I can all the mathematics. Uh, we just talk a, a little bit about probabilities, of course, and percentage, and a little bit more. But <clears throat> it's more about what is the idea behind uh, this approach. And I will be focusing on data analysis because I think most of you uh, in your research use at some point data and use different methods for data analysis. But sometimes, maybe because yet in universities and degrees, the, the Bayesian framework is not uh, widely taught, although uh, the use is in is increasing and increasing in, in all the fields. So the idea of this workshop it was to, to let you know that there is this other different approach and emphasizing the differences or similarities with the frequentist approach or emphasizing as well in which cases the Bayesian methodology may work better for your research. So this workshop is part of the series of statistical workshops that we organize as part of the Science Practice Hub. Uh, and, and this is run for Corel and also ILD. I'm a senior lecturer in stats in the University of Greenwich in the School of Computing and Mathematics, in case you don't know me. So I start here with the site of a famous British writer, George Wells, that we don't know exactly when in his life uh, it was impossible to see I was trying to find the exact source of this site, uh, but apparently he said that statistical thinking will one day be as necessary for efficient citizenships as the ability to read and write. So I think probably here we can all agree that this is the case. We are surrounded by a lot of, lot of information, statistics and data, and we use them all the time in our everyday life. Uh, you turn on the TV and you will see a lot of the stats, plots, graphs, etc. relating with COVID, weather forecasts or more. Uh, you pick up your phone and you will see um, some statistics related with how many steps you walk per day, your average uh, number of steps you walk per day, um, how much you use your screen, your phone screen, and etc. But still, the other important question is how we achieve the level of the statistical literacy that we need to understand all this information that is all, all the time overwhelmed us sometimes, right? And in my opinion, and based on things that I see sometimes on TV, sometimes in newspapers, etc., we say the answer is it's no, we still need to develop more um, statistical literacy. So this quote came from the epigraphy of this book. This is a very old book, but very nice. I recommend it to you. And the title is How to Lie with the Statistics. And many of the main points that are done in this book are still valid today. Problems such as that correlation does not imply causation, problems related with the random sample, etc., are, are still present today. And you can see <clears throat> as well, for example, just to mention one of the problems you, you may see in the everyday life, uh, there is some weather forecast presenter in an American TV show <clears throat> who predicted that there was a 50% probability of rain on a Saturday and a 50% probability of rain on the Sunday, and then conclude that on this weekend will rain for sure. And, and that's an incorrect deduction or conclusion, right? Because you can think on this as the probability of rain and as the result of flipping a coin, and if it heads, then it will rain, and and if it's head uh, tails, then it will not rain, right? <clears throat> and of course, we know that although there is a high chance that at least one of these days will rain, you still could flip the coin twice and get two tails. And there is a probability that none of the days in the weekend will rain. And this is people who are professional, um, people who have degrees and are 
have studied a lot, where still problems interpreting probabilities and in particular conditional probabilities um, arise in many, many contexts. And, and I think this, this is important and this is something that we need to um, highlight. Let me just mention here another example, and this is taken from a book, another very nice book called Calculated Risks. And this is about the doctor's thinking, how doctors think about probability. And in this example, we have uh, the following setting. We know that for women there is in the, in the 40s, the probability that they have breast cancer is about 1%. Now, if a woman has breast cancer and go to the hospital and do a scan, this scan will come positive. There is indicating um, a breast cancer in 90% of the cases. Okay, so the probability of a true positive is 90%. But there is also the possibility of false positives, like maybe now you are aware about all the things because of all of the COVID tests, right? <laughs> So if a woman, a woman does not have breast cancer but go for a test, it may still come positive even when she doesn't have breast cancer. And this happened with a probability of 9%. So now here is my question for you. One woman in this range of age go to the hospital, has the mammogram and it comes as a positive. And the question is, what is the probability that she indeed has breast cancer. And what do you think? And I will move to the chat to see your answers. It's just a guess, don't try to apply formula, formulas, just what your intuition is telling you. Do you want to, to risk any answer? <laughs> Good. Some more answers? A couple more. And I will come back to this. Okay, so we have um, one, two, three, four people given high probabilities, like in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, then we have one, two, that said about 1%, and one, two, two, three between nine and ten percent and, and this is very similar to what I'm going to show you now. Well the person who wrote this this book um, performed a research and and he asked to 24 uh, German doctors in different disciplines like um, gynecologists, obstetricians etc and and he got that a third of the doctors said that the probability was about 90%. Another third say between 50 and 80, so it's still quite high. And the last third is split in two. Some of them say 1% and only one over six says about 10%. And the correct answer is 9%, as some of you have said. And we will come back to this and, and, and I will um, we will explain why the answer is 9% later on the talk. But here, what I want to highlight is that it's very important that this, imagine you are one of them and you go to the doctor and you are diagnosed uh, with cancer. You did some tests and you are diagnosed with cancer. So then you really want to know what is the probability that the diagnosis is correct. And and, and for that, the person who will tell you about this risk is the doctor, is the person who you talk to with, right? So you do this test, you go back to your consultant, and the consultant will tell you the results. 
And there have been some evidence in the past of people being diagnosed with um, HIV when they didn't have, and the consequences of this, and, and etc. So the problem here is that when we are dealing with probabilities, our intuition, our first intuition, our fast thinking sometimes fails. And we need to think slower. We need to think slower and we need to have the tools and we need to be aware of these problems and, and try to get the correct interpretation of all these probabilities, especially if someone else um, is, is involved in this, like here, the patients, right? So the doctors need to really understand this to be able to transmit the risk to the patients in the correct way. So because of this, and there are many, many examples, I've seen all, all the day, all the time, I'm seeing examples of misinterpretations, uh, miscommunications in everywhere, is that as part of the uh, practice science, how we decided to organize these statistical workshops with the aim to promote statistical literacy and highlight the importance of quantitative analysis in research and I don't want to open here a debate about qualitative analysis versus quantitative analysis. I think both are important. Uh, quantitative analysis sometimes can complement your qualitative research quite well, can bring some, some other view to, to your problem, and sometimes can bring some objectivity to your analysis. But objectivity in quotation marks because even when we are trying to do a quantitative analysis, you will have to make some subjective decisions. For example, if you want to measure um, language proficiency when someone is studying a second language, there are different ways you can do this. <coughs> some people, for example, may, I don't know, um, look at the vocabulary of this person in a limited amount of time, or, or you may look up some of the famous international tests about language proficiency, uh, etc. So when you are choosing how to measure that construct, that problem, how to translate your research question into a quantitative variable, you are making decisions and the validity of your results will depend on this. OK, so we also need to be aware of this because otherwise we think we are applying objectivity to our analysis when it's not quite the case. And finally, I also would like to encourage through these workshops interdisciplinary research and collaborations between different fields. We don't need to all become statisticians to be able to, to do a quantitative research on a method or statisticians don't have to become uh, linguists or uh, biologists, etc., to be able to apply their knowledge to these fields. We can work together. And I think this is every time more and more important, and it was clear for us in the last breath how much they value and appreciate interdisciplinary research, and this trend will continue. So in the first uh, workshop that we have, maybe some of you attended this. This was run by Gosha Voigts. Uh, she introduced or she discussed some of the most commonly uh, used techniques following the frequentist approach, uh, the hypothesis testing, t-tests, ANOVA, regression, etc. And she emphasizes a lot some misinterpretations and common mistakes um, in this methodology. So some of the key points that we can take home from the previous talk were the importance of the model validation and checking assumptions. Some of them are, for example, normality. Many of, many of the techniques or methods that you may be applying assume normality, but there are a lot of research and surveys and reviews that, um, um, that um, survey that many of these researchers are using these techniques without checking that the assumptions of the methods are met. Maybe they are, maybe they are not, but if the assumptions of the methods are not met, then the conclusions that you're getting for your analysis are not valid. So for example, if you are doing some t-test 
uh, we are assuming that the variable that you're analyzing, the variable of interest, follows a normal distribution. Or when you are applying regression, the, the dependent variable, the variable that you want to model, must be normal because all the inference that you are performing after that, when you are trying to check whether your predictors are significant or not, whether they have a significant impact or effect in your dependent variable, whether your your coefficients are different from zero, you are using the t-test because this is derived from the assumption that your dependent variable is normal. But if, if your dependent variable is not normal, then these estimators do not follow a t-distribution and the t-test does not make sense in that case. When the normality assumption is not met, sometimes this can be overcome by a large sample size, because depending on what you're studying, but for example, if you are studying something related with the average of the reading time of some students, then we know by the central limit theorem that um, the distribution of the average in the sample will converge to a normal and then we can apply this method, right? But large sample sizes, um, we don't always have large sample sizes. And for example, I have seen a lot in L2 research that people tend to use a sample size equal to 20 without much scientific justification for that. It may be the case that 20 is enough, that depends on the variable and many things, or it may be the case that you need a larger sample size, but there needs to be a careful consideration about the sample size, in particular when the normal assumption is not met. And the other problems that were highlighted in the pre previous talk are related with very common misinterpretations about the p-value when you're performing tests, whatever test it is, t-test, ANOVA test, or some other test. Many people tend to think about the p-value of if this were the probability that the null hypothesis is true. Because maybe when we are teaching, just to help my students, I say, think about the p-value as a measure of evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. But the p-value is the probability that your statistic, for example, the sample mean, uh, will be as extreme as the value that you got in your sample. So it's a probability related with the value of your statistic and, and not with the null hypothesis. And this will be conditioned on the null hypothesis that you are assuming. Then we know the rule that if the p-value is smaller than the significant level, then we reject the null hypothesis. And if the p-value is larger than the significant level, then we don't reject the null hypothesis. But how do we interpret these results? Well, if the p-value is greater than the significant level, we don't reject the null hypothesis. And some people, and a lot of papers have this published, interpret this or, or conclude from this that the null hypothesis is true. Your new hypothesis may be that there is no effect of some treatment of some different type of teaching style, right? And, and you're trying to prove that this new, this new uh, teaching method uh, is better. Uh, it will uh, generate a, a greater performance for the students. But then you collect your data and you find out that the p-value is greater than the significant level, then e you reject the null hypothesis. This is not the same as the null hypothesis. This is true. Um, this probability, again, is computed when we're assuming this null hypothesis, and there are many different null hypotheses that we could assume. Maybe a way to think about this is to think on the law on, or criminology that you know uh, when there is a suspect who maybe committed some murder, uh, everybody is assumed to be innocent until we prove the contrary, right? And, we, and then uh, the prosecutor, etc., trying to find evidence, uh, the proof that this suspect indeed committed the murder. But if the evidence is not strong enough or you don't have evidence, then the only we can say is that we haven't proved that, that this person is the murderer. We keep our assumption that he's innocent, 
uh, we have not proved that this person is innocent. Maybe in the future we find out more evidence and we are able to prove that this person um, was, was the criminal in this case or not. And similarly, if you reject the null hypothesis, we still cannot say that the alternative hypothesis is true. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm disappointing you here, but we'll never be able to, to know which of these hypotheses is true unless we are able to observe the whole population. Here we are only working with samples and we are trying to make informed decisions. Right. But even if you reject the new hypothesis, then that means that there is a strong evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. But it doesn't mean that the alternative hypothesis is true. Indeed, the significant level is the probability that you will reject the new hypothesis when is true. OK, so maybe the p-value is lower than the significant level. You reject H0, but still H0 can be true. So you really need to be very careful when you are interpreting um, hypothesis testing. Now, what do we do if the assumption of normality is not met or the sample size is small? Well, there are other alternatives. One of them are non-parametric methods, like for example, bootstrap, another alternative, which is the um, the topic of this talk is the Bayesian framework. And now I have an, another slide here. This um, Kushke, I think is how you pronounce, is the name of a professor in the University of Indiana. And he studied the psychology of the brain. And, and he says that whereas in the 20th century was dominated by the new hypothesis significance testing in the 21st century or the 21st century is becoming Bayesian. And he has written a very nice book, this one that you can see on the slide, which is not highly mathematically, um, is more focused on the applications. And in the second edition of this book, it will also show you how to perform some of these statistical data analysis using either R, JAX, or STAN. So if you want to explore with this new framework, this may be a good book to start with. Now, before we continue, let me present you the following example. Imagine that you have done some research, you have written your paper, and now you want to submit this paper for publication. A good journal for us as statisticians will be uh, JASA, the Journal of American Statistical Association. You can think of any other journal, important journal in your area. Now, this particular journal receives approximately 700 original submissions every year and has an acceptance rate, an average acceptance rate of 10%. This is true data. <laughs> okay, imagine that you submit your paper to, to this journal and is accepted. This is your first paper that you submit. Now I want to ask you, what is the probability that your next submission to this journal will also be accepted? OK, so remember the numbers. These journals accept on average 10% of the submissions. Now you, you have submitted your first paper to this journal and has been accepted. Now what is the probability that your next submission, your second paper submitted to this journal will also be accepted? And now I will move to the chat to see your answers. Many people saying 
and some other people say more than 10 percent. Something over 10 percent. Um, it could be the same year or not for for Thomas. OK. So I would say that. Someone say it will increase your chances that your second paper is accepted. Well, I was expecting to see more people saying greater than 10 percent because 10 percent is, a, is a, the average of all people who is submitted. Right, but now you the first one, your very first paper that you have submitted has been accepted. So that's giving us some extra information. It may mean you were lucky. <laughs> it could be, <laughs> or maybe this is talking about the quality of your research. And then you could be more optimistic the next time you, you have submitted, submitting, right? So going going back to my slides. If your answer was anything between 10 percent and 100, then you were thinking patient because you were updating the information that we have. Before you knew everything about yourself and your own chances, the only thing you knew is that about 10 percent of the papers that are submitted to this journal are accepted. Now you have more information you have submitted your own paper, it has been accepted, and now in the Bayesian view, that means that the probabilities that your second paper will be accepted as well are greater than 10% because we have new evidence. And the new evidence is that your first paper that was submitted to this journal, it was um, accepted. So, this is one of the main ideas with this different approach, and is that we are going to take into account the past knowledge that we had, in this case, that 10% of the papers were accepted, and we are going to update the knowledge that we had up to now with the new data, with the new evidence that is arriving. So, one of the main differences between these two approaches are the way in that they see probabilities. We, we all know what probability is, right? It's, it's a measure of uncertainty. It would be a number between 0 and 1. If it's closer to 1, it means that that event is more likely to happen. If it's closer to 0, it means that that event is less likely to happen. But how do we actually or accurately define these probabilities, how they are computed? Right? And, and, and these thoughts about probability mathematics have evolved through the years. But one of them is the frequentist definition of probability, which is the one that is used by the frequentist framework for the statistical inference, where the probability is defined as the long run relative frequency of an event. And maybe the best way to think about this is through the simple example of tossing a coin. Imagine that we want to calculate the probability of observing a head when you toss the coin. So one way to compute that is to toss this coin infinitely many times and compute the proportion of heads that you got in all those trials and that relative frequency will be your measure for the probability of heads. It makes sense. We all use this sometimes, but it has some assumptions, this definition. And one of them is that the event needs to be replicable. So you should be able to perform this experiment again and again and again. And as you are performing these events again and again and again, the system remains the same. So that means that I'm flipping the coin and after I have flipped the coin two millions of times, the coin has not been deteriorated. 
I'm not tired, I'm flipping the coin exactly in the same way, etc. So that uh, the probabilities in the past and the future are not changed with the environment. Okay, so this event should be replicable and the system should remain the same. Now this theory, it was well established by the end, end of 19th century and all the developments of the stats since then or in that century mainly driven by Fisher, Neyman and Pearson, which are maybe the fathers of hypothesis testing, are based on this frequentist paradigm. So assume, now I will show you a numerical example for this, uh, assume that we toss a coin 10 times and for example, we get these results, heads, tails, heads, 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 tails, heads, heads, heads. So eight, heads and two tails, then the proportion of heads is 0 0.8. Now imagine I've tossed the coin once again, so I have the 11th trial and maybe uh, this is tails. So now with a sample of size 11, I have eight tails, um, eight heads and three tails. So eight divided by 11 will be the new proportion of heads. And imagine I keep doing this, increasing the sample size and computing the proportion of heads. So the plot that I'm showing you now is showing the sample size in your horizontal axis. So I'm increasing the sample size and tossing the coin once more, once more, once more. And in the vertical axis, I'm showing you the proportion of heads. And this is a real simulation I did this a plot for a class I was given in a master. Of course, I didn't flip a, co a real coin. I was using computers, but I had said that the real probability of heads was 0 0.5. So this was a fair coin. And this was the result that I got for, from that simulation. Of course, if I run the simulation again, I may get different results, right? <clears throat> and what we can see is that at the beginning, the proportion of heads is very volatile because there is a high variance when the sample size is small, but it tends to stabilize as we increase the sample size. Still, after 50 tosses, the estimated probability of heads is about 0 0.6, while the real one it was 0 0.5, so not quite accurate. So I keep increasing the sample size, and now I'm showing you the proportion of heads for a sample size of 50, 100, 500, 1,000, and 5,000 for this simulation. And we can see that for large sample sizes, like 1,000, 5,000, uh, the estimation for the probability of heads is quite accurate, even for 500, maybe, if you want to, 0.51. But when the sample size is small, there may be large deviations, of course. If I, as I was saying, if I repeat now the experiment, I may get completely different numbers because it will be a new sample, right? But what I want to show you with this example is that when the sample size is small, you get a lot of variation from one possible sample to another possible sample. So there is a lot of uncertainty around your estimation. So this frequentist approach works well when first the experiment is replicable. You can repeat this experiment and again and again under the same conditions and the sample size is large. But unfortunately, this is not always the case. So now what is the Bayesian view about probabilities? Well, the Bayesian definition of probability is a subjective probability. Probability for Bayesians is a subjective experience of uncertainty. It's how you perceive the uncertainty related with some event. And maybe to make it more clear, let's work about this through an example. And in this case, the example will be like placing a bet for a result. <clears throat> Imagine, well, I would like to know what is the probability that Manchester City will win the final of the Champion Leagues in a couple of weeks, right? This year in 2021. Well, this event will happen only once. It will be played in, in Portugal, I think, in a couple of weeks, and that's it. We cannot replicate this event. But I want to place a bet, right? 
and and then I want an estimation for this probability. So what I'm going to do here, we cannot think on repeating this event infinitely. Instead, I'm going to use all the prior information that I have related with uh, these two teams, um, all the prior information that I have about finance of the Ch Champion League and my personal judgment, right? So maybe I can think uh, is it Manchester City, Chelsea, the plane? No, Liverpool. I go to the chat to see if there is any football fan. Well, anyway. Uh, yeah, who, who is the other finalist? Now it's gone from my mind. Is it? Chelsea. Yeah, Chelsea. <laughs> so maybe we can think on how many times Manchester City and Chelsea have played again against each other and how many times Manchester City won. I use this information as an estimation for that, um, but I will also take into account how they were doing in this season in the Premier League. I think Manchester City is, is a champion so that they are playing better right now. Uh, you can think of how do they perform in finals because finals are, tend to be different than a normal game on a league, etc. So I will use all that information that I have up to now to ha estimate what is the probability that Manchester City win before I play my bet. Now, once the final is played, we know the winner, then my information will be updated. So maybe um, in the F FA Cup, uh, the odds in favour of Leicester were, were not very big, <laughs> right? But now we have updated our knowledge and next time we will see, OK, be careful with Leicester. has been won the Premier League a few years ago, now won FA Cup, etc. So we Bayesians believe that this type of reasoning is more in accordance with the progression of science. We learn from previous research findings and we incorporate that information that we have in our current research, in our present study. Maybe the previous findings will have an impact on in the area that I'm investigating now. I want to, I was reading some papers on this and I want to investigate on this. Maybe it will have an impact on the research questions that I have. Maybe it will have an impact in the hypothesis that I have, etc. The Bayesian framework fits very well with this idea of progression of science because you can incorporate all the background knowledge that you have explicitly in your statistical model. Sometimes uh, the results can be in accordance with the previous results or even strengths the previous results sometimes will be uh, opposite or different to the previous results. But I believe this is science. So let me now show you an example that I've taken from a paper of uh, these people uh, that is called the Bayesian Revolution on Second Language uh, research and it's about for parents that live in a particular region and they belong to um, a language minority uh, families and and the concern here is whether they prefer bilingual education for their children or monolingual education meaning only English for their children excuse me <clears throat> So the aim of this research is to know what is the preferred approach for the education for these parents, bilingual or monolingual. So to answer this question, we would like to know what is the proportion of parents that prefer the bilingual education. <clears throat> 
or if you prefer, the monolingual. If you know one of these, you know the other, because there are only two possibilities here in this study. Are they bilingual or monolingual? So the variable of interest for this study is the parents' preference. What do they prefer? Bilingual education or monolingual education? And the population parameter and the interest in particular here is the proportion of parents that prefer bilingual, bilingual preference. OK, so one thing is the variable and another thing is the parameter that you want to estimate. Maybe you want to know what is the variation in the responses. Uh, so maybe you're interested in the variance of this variable. But here we are interested in the proportion of parents that prefer bilingual education. This is um, it's not real data, it's a simulated example from this paper. So let's assume that 100 parents were randomly selected and asked this question, which type of education they prefer, and 55 of them said they prefer the bilingual education. Now, the estimator for the proportion of the parents that prefer bilingual education will be equal to 55 divided by 100, that is 55 percent. Now, given this information of this study, this empirical study that we have, can we discover the real proportion in the entire region? Well, it will depend how many people are in this entire region, so maybe this is a very large sample size, but remember also that this 55% is just one point estimate. If now we were able to repeat this experiment or maybe some other researchers investigating the same and do they perform their own uh, survey and they get to a different result. So if you repeat, you take a new sample of 100 parents in the same region, you mo you're most likely to going to have a different answer, a different number for this. Right, because the sample is random, then when you compute the proportion in this random sample, that number that we, you will come up with is also random. So 55 is just one of them. So how can we somehow take into account this variation that we may have from sample to sample? This uncertainty around this estimation. When the frequent is way, this will be by the use of confidence intervals. Right, that I'm sure you have used for your own research at some point or you know about them. So for this toy example, the 95 confidence interval for the proportion of parents that prefer bilingual education is uh, no less 45% to 65%. Okay, 44.7, 64.9. Now the problem is how do we interpret this confidence interval? And again, a lot of confusion about interpretation regarding confidence interval, not only my students, also researchers, because to be honest, it's a little bit tricky, the interpretation. It's not very intuitive. I will tell you what it does not mean. This confidence interval does not mean that the real proportion of parents that prefer bilingual education is between 44.7 and 64.9 percent with a probability of 95%. We cannot say that the probability of parents that prefer bilingual education, that the proportion, that the proportion of parents that prefer bilingual education is between these two numbers with a probability of 95%. Because the proportion of parents that prefer bilingual education is not a random variable. For the frequentist approach, the proportion of parents that prefer bilingual education is a fixed number. It's a number that is a true proportion. We don't know it, it's unknown, but it's fixed. And then if it's not random, we cannot talk about what is the probability that is here or is not here. It's either there or it's not. There is no more probability or less probability. What is random in the frequentist approach is the sample, is the sample that you are taking. And therefore, 
in the way that we construct this confidence interval, the lower limit and the upper limit of the confidence interval are random as well. But once you have observed your sample and computed this lower bound and upper bound, there is no more randomness left in your confidence interval. The confidence, so what does it mean then the 95% that of level of confidence? Well, it only indicates that if you are able to repeat this procedure many, many times, that is to take again a sample of size 100 in the same region, etc., and you compute the proportion of parents, you compute the 95 confidence interval, and you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it infinitely many times, then from all the confidence intervals that you have constructed, 95% of them will contain the true proportion. And you may have seen a similar graph to this in the past. Uh, so here, this has been simulated, assuming that the real proportion of bilingual education preference is 75%. Then from this population, uh, it has been taken samples of size 100, computed the proportion in the sample and computed the confidence interval. And each of these lines is a different confidence interval obtained from the same population where 75% of the parents prefer bilingual education. The dots represent the sample mean. <laughs> and we can see that some of these confidence intervals that we have obtained do contain the true proportion value. So 75% is inside a confidence interval. But in some cases, the ones that are in red, uh, they don't contain the true parameter value. Now, when you have your sample and you have computed a confidence interval like this one, you have no way to know if you are in one of the good cases, the black confidence interval, or in one of the um, bad cases, the red one. You know that most of the cases are good, 95% of them contain the truth, but this one in particular, I don't know in which case it is. Moreover, if you look carefully here, for example, this confidence interval for the sample 16th goes more or less between, let's say, 73 and 89%. And this is a confidence interval that contains the true parameter value. But then there is another good case, the sample 18, where the confidence interval goes between 58% and 76%. So these two cases, these two different cases of good confidence intervals that contain the true parameter value almost do not overlap. And they are giving us completely different impressions about what is the real proportion of uh, bilingual preference. So summarizing about interpretation of confidence intervals, a single confidence interval does not tell us a percentage of certainty that this range that you got contains a true parameter value. The interpretation is more related with the long run procedure. OK, if you repeat this many, many, many times, 95% of the confidence interval will contain the true parameter value. But now remember what was our research question, and we want to, to know what is the most preferred method of education. Is the bilingual or the monolingual? And well, to answer that question, we will need a hypothesis test like this. So let's assume that theta here is the proportion of parents that prefer the bilingual education. So the null hypothesis will be that theta is lower or equal than 50%, and the alternative hypothesis is that is greater than 50%. Okay. That, that the bilingual education system is the most preferred around these points. But if you look at the confidence interval that we got, it goes from more or less 45% to 65%, and 50% is there, and therefore we cannot reject the null hypothesis. We cannot say that the proportion is greater than 50%, in which case most of the parents prefer bilingual education. We cannot say either that most of the parents prefer the monolingual education. 
So our research question is not answered with this data. This data does not provide strong evidence to favor one of these hypotheses against the other one. So what would be the, the evasion way? One, another of the main difference is that the parameter that you're trying to uh, estimate is thought by Bayesians as a random variable. Either because it's random by nature or because it's fixed or it's unknown. So that uncertainty that we have about the value of this parameter is modeled by a random variable. That uncertainty that we have around this proportion of parents that prefer bilingual education is, is expressed in the as a random variable. Now we know that random variables are characterized by probability distributions, right? If you know the probability distribution of a random variable, perfect, you can know many things about this random variable. This is a possible distribution, I'm using here a beta distribution, but I just wanted to show one possible distribution that could represent, for example, the proportion of bilingual preference. We know that the proportion is a number between 0 and 1, so I'm using the beta distribution because the range for this distribution is between 0 and 1. So what is this distribution telling us? Well, this distribution is showing us that this seems to be more, it's more likely that parents prefer bilingual education over monolingual education because uh, most of the density is around here for values of 0 0.5 or higher for this example that I've done, right? Um, we could look at values around 0 0.2 and look at the area under the curve in that range and we will see that the area there is very little. That is indicating that 0 0.2, for example, is not a likely value for this proportion. While if we look, for example, at uh, 0 0.8 and the area under the curve around 0 0.8 is much larger than 0 0.2. So 0 0.8 is more likely than 0 0.2, etc. You can also look at the numerical summaries of the distribution, such as the mean, the median, the mode. You can look at the variance and you can compute any probability that you want. Okay, if you know the distribution of a random variable. So for in the Bayesian approach or the Bayesian inference, we'll assume that the parameter that you want to estimate is a random variable, either because it's random by nature or because we don't know it. And that uncertainty is expressed in this uh, distribution. Now I will summarize what we have been discussing so far and then do a, a short break. Um, about similarities and differences between frequencies and Bayesians. So the starting point is the difference between how probabilities define. By the frequencies is the probability seen as a relative frequency in the long run, and by the Bayesians, probability is a subjective measure of uncertainty. In the frequencies approach, the parameter that you want to estimate is a fixed quantity while in the Bayesian approach is a random variable. In the frequencies approach, uncertainty is quantified by the use of repeated sampling, right? And in the Bayesians, it will be contained in the distribution of the parameter. The higher the variance of the distribution, the higher the uncertainty. And this is what we are going to discuss after the break. In the frequencies approach, the prior knowledge that we have is not taken into account in the current study, and it will be included in the statistical model under the Bayesian approach. So, I'm not seeing any question in the chat so far. <laughs> so either it's all very clear or you're completely lost. <laughs> and I suggest five minutes break, so maybe we can be back at five past five. Is that okay? Yes, that's great. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see you soon. <laughs> okay, see you in a bit.
where did I got disconnect? When did I got disconnected? But I was talking about how you can incorporate uh, the previous information into your current research and which type of information we can take into account to incorporate in our current research. So I was saying that this information of previous knowledge may come in different ways. Maybe there have been previous experiments done in the same topic, or maybe you have data from previous ways of this survey. Uh, sometimes there have been meta-analyses. These studies are trying to combine, they look like a survey of all previous uh, quantitative analysis, or you may be able to ask the opinion or the knowledge of an expert in the area. And I think this is more or less when Maria started to call me. <laughs> and, and there is also uh, this first two we call subjective information, and there is also objective information. For, ex for example, if you are trying to estimate a variance, you know that this parameter is always positive. It can never be negative. Right? So that's objective information. Or if you are trying to estimate a proportion, you know that the proportion is always a number between zero and one. And that, that could be also incorporated in your analysis as objective information. Now, all this background information, previous studies, previous results, previous research, etc., will enter into your Bayesian statistical model in the form of a distribution. A distribution for the parameter because remember we were talking in the first part that the parameter is modeled as a random variable is thought as a random variable in the Bayesian framework and therefore random variables can be described by a distribution now this is called the prior distribution because it's, it's what we know about the parameter before you perform your current study is what you what you know up to now. So with all the previous information, past information, what do we know about this parameter? And this will be incorporated in your model through a distribution that is called the prior distribution. So the previous knowledge or even the lack of knowledge, if you don't have any previous knowledge, that can also happen, right? You may be doing research in something very novel where there are no previous results on the topic. Uh, will be incorporated in this distribution for the parameter of interest. And there are different types of prior distributions. There are the informative prior distributions, that is when you really have good information about what you're studying, your prior belief about the parameter, which possible values this parameter can take, and the process of transforming this previous research or the knowledge of the expert into a distribution is called prior elicitation and prior elicitation by itself is a huge topic mm. and if you want to know more about that i'll suggest you to read this very good book sometimes we have some information but it's not very strong and we will still use that little information that we have and we will call this type of prior distributions weekly informative, weak informative prior distributions. It may be that you may have an idea of what is the average of something, average within time, but, but you're not very confident on this, so you will have a distribution that is more or less centered on what you think is the average, or the average could be, but with a very, very large variance uh, reflecting uh, your uncertainty about this, right? So your previous knowledge is very weak and then you will have a weekly informative prior distribution. And there are also other types of distributions that are called objective priors or non-informative uh, priors. And this is when you have non-previous -pre knowledge about the parameter. Usually here, and now a little bit more of mathematics, these are distributions that are not well defined. That's what I'm calling improper uh, prior distributions. Like could be a uniform distribution between minus infinity and infinity, a beta zero, zero, just the priors. And I just want you to know that this possibility is there. There are cases where you do have prior informations and there are cases when you just have a little prior information, not very strong, or cases when you don't have any information at all. 
if you use objective priors, then the result of the Bayesian framework will be the same as the result of the frequentist approach because all the estimation will be derived by the new data that you have, okay, like, like in the frequentist approach. Still, you will have some of the advantages of the Bayesian framework, like could be the interpretation of the results that we will see soon. So here I want to show you different possible priors that you could set. For example, this is about reading skills. And maybe we don't know anything about reading skills. And then your prior distribution will just be a uniform distribution, so completely flat and goes between minus infinity and infinity. So it could be anything. You are not prioritizing here any value over other, any range of values over other range of values. But this is probably too extreme, as I'm sure there are many, many studies about reading skills. So you may have uh, some idea of what to expect, which values to expect for the reading skills. And then you can express that in the location of your distribution and give a higher density around these values. So here, this little bump here is reflecting that around these values or these values are more likely to happen than others. Instead, in the first case where it's all flat, every range has equal probability. But written skills is more likely going to be measured with some kind of a scale or a scores that I think you, you use a lot in your fields. So maybe we know that it's not possible to get values lower than 40 and higher than 180 because this is the range of the scores that we get with our method uh, to measure the reading skills. So in that case, I will not consider values lower than 40 as possible or greater than 180 as possible. I will only have a prior and every value between 40 and 180 is possible. And it's flat. This is weakly informative. I have some information, cannot be lower than 40, cannot be greater than 180 for the method, how this variable is constructed. But I'm not prioritizing any value over other. Now in the figure D, uh, it's again bounded between 40 and 180, but values around 100, the score of 100, are more likely than others, but it still has a high variance. As you can see, this distribution is very spread on the possible range, on the range of possible values between 40 and 180. And now in figure E, we have a um, much more precise prior distribution. So the variance is small or the precision is high because we see it's highly concentrated upon 100. So we know the 100 is more or less the average for the reading skills and we are very confident on this prior information that we have. And in the last one, it's also very informative, but with a different average, we need to be very careful that we don't have it there. Um, we are not misspecifying the, the prior distribution. When you are using very informative priors, that is with a small variance or high precision, you need to be sure that you can trust on the previous information that you have. We will see why later. So that's the prior. That's what we know up to now. Now you are performing your own study. You collect your own data and you, you will and you will analyze this new data that you get. So the second component, if you want, of the Bayesian framework will be this, the new evidence of the data. And that will be introduced with the use of the likelihood function. Maybe you have here, if you are using frequentist methods, about the likelihood function. That will be a function that is describing how the data is generated. Uh, this function will also show you which values of the parameter are more likely given the data that you have observed. So for this data that I have, um, for this coin tosses that I have, maybe the what are the most likely values for the probability of heads? And I will ask you a question about that in a moment. And note that the likelihood function is used 
in, for example, the maximum likelihood estimation is not only used in the patient method, it's the model, it's how you model your data. Okay, so let's suppose that we toss a coin, we toss this coin 10 times, and we observe from these 10 tosses, nine heads and one tail. Now my question to you is, what do you think is the most likely value for the probability of heads with this evidence that we have? From 10 tosses, nine were heads and only one was tail. What do you think is the most likely value given this data for the probability of heads? And I'm moving to the chat, so I'll see your answers. Any guess? We toss the coin 10 times. We observe nine heads and only one tail. Andrea said 90%. Any other guess about the probability of heads? For example, I will not expect the probability of heads to be very low, like 0 0.1, because in 10 tosses, I, I got a lot of heads, right? So 0 0.1 doesn't seem to be very likely with this data that I have. You're yeah, thinking well, Trevor, between 0 0.5 and 0 0.9, but the question is the most likely, just one value. You got nine heads out of 10, what is the most likely value for the probability of heads? Yes, I guess Janine means 0 0.9. Remember the probability is a number between 0 and 1. And Andrea said 90%, so 0 0.9. And this is the correct answer. And this is the maximum likelihood method. So if the probability of heads were 0 0.5 and you toss a coin only twice, you will expect to see one head, one tail, but maybe you observe two heads or two tails, right? But it's more likely to get one head, one tail than two tosses with the same face. Right, so if you observe nine heads and one tail, then the most likely value for this data of the probability of head is 0 0.9. Is the most likely given the data. But of course, the probability maybe is different, maybe 0 0.8, maybe 0 0.5. Um, and that's the, that's the evidence that you got. But is, this is just one way that is a logical way, it has good thinking to estimate the probability of heads. For this data that I got, the most likely value for the probability of head is 0 0.9 because I got nine heads out of 10. So I'm going back to the slides now. And just to tell you that for this little example of the coin tosses, the likelihood function here for your data is a binomial distribution with parameters n and p. n is the number of times and you toss a coin and p is the probability of heads. Right? We are counting the number of heads out of n trials and that's what this binomial distribution is telling us. What is the probability that out of 10 trials I get nine heads or five heads or four heads, etc. And for the case of the monolingual bilingual education, the likelihood function will be the same. Because if you remember, the answers of the parents is a binary variable. They either prefer bilingual education or monolingual education. Let's say bilingual education is heads, monolingual education is tails. So when you are taking a random sample from this region of parents and you are asking this question, you may get 
20 parents saying they prefer bilingual education or maybe 40 parents out of the 100, right? So it's equivalent like tossing the coin 100 times and counting the number of heads. Remember that we got 55 parents said they prefer the bilingual education. So this, what you see on this slide, is the likelihood function. And so here in the vertical axis, I'm measuring the likelihood, how likely is of the proportion of bilingual preference given the evidence that we had. And what we are trying to see here is what is the most likely, like, likely value for this proportion given the data that we have. So I want to see the likelihood is measured in the vertical axis. So this, man, this function is maximum here. And the value of the proportion that maximizes this function is exactly 0.55 which is estimated that we got before the, the sample proportion. <clears throat> now, we have seen two ingredients on the Bayesian framework, the prior distribution that incorporates oral background knowledge, the likelihood function that is the new evidence, the new data that we have. Now, how, how do we update the knowledge that we have? Well, the prior distribution and the likelihood function, they are both going to be combined to obtain a new distribution for the parameter. And that is called the posterior distribution for the parameter. In this case, the posterior distribution for the proportion of parents that prefer the bilingual education. So this distribution will represent our knowledge about this parameter after we have observed the new data. So this distribution will show us how likely each possible value for the parameter is given your prior distribution, given the model of the likelihood function that you are assuming and given the data that you got. OK. So here I want to show you on the blue line is one possible prior distribution we could have set for the proportion of bilingual preference. And the red line here is the likelihood function for this. The binomial distribution that I have shown you is rescale. So we see the, the um, these distributions more or less in the, the same size. And, and the black line here is the posterior distribution. So we combine the prior, the blue is representing the distribution of the proportion before we observe the new data. So just what we know up to now, this is pressed there, and it looks like um, I use a distribution that has a mean around a third, 0 0.33. This is what I thought before. Now I collect my new data and 55 parents say they prefer bilingual education out of 100. So the light, the maximum likelihood estimator was 0 0.55. Now the posterior distribution, the result of the Bayesian framework that combines these two things, the new data with the prior knowledge is the black line here. And we can see that the, the posterior mean um, is about 0 0.43. So something in between the maximum likelihood estimator and the prior information that we had. Now, how these two are combined in depends on how much prior information we have and the sample size of the, of the data as well. So if you have a prior information that is very weak, and this will be reflected on, on a very flat prior distribution, and or you have good sample size, a very informative sample, then the posterior will be closer to the likelihood because your prior information is weak and your current new data is good and then the posterior will be closer to this. But if instead you have a small sample size, but you have very strong previous knowledge, so you have a prior distribution that is very informative, then the posterior distribution will be closer to the prior distribution. And I want to show you the impact of this different possible settings in this plot. 
So here the dashed line is the prior distribution and we have, you see a completely flat prior distribution and the dot line is the likelihood, is the data. But the sample size is small, I only have 10 observations. Even when the sample size is small, because the prior distribution is completely flat, then the posterior, which is the full line here, is very close to the likelihood. Now, in the bottom left, I have the same likelihood, the same data, same size, 10 observations, but weakly informative prior, and we can see now that the posterior is a compromise between these two. Now, looking at the top uh, right, again, very flat prior distribution. We don't have prior knowledge, we have complete lack of knowledge about this problem, so completely flat prior distribution and very strong likelihood function, sample size is big, and then the posterior is basically the same as the likelihood, and the result of the frequencies approach and the patient will be the same. But in the bottom right, we are using a large sample size, so informative likelihood function, and a weak informative prior and we can see that the posterior is shifted a little bit to the left because it's being influenced by the prior knowledge that we have. Why the prior and the likelihood are different? So maybe the prior information wasn't quite exactly about the same that we are studying now, or we got a very bad sample. It sometimes happens. Sometimes you toss the coin 10 times and you get 10 heads, and that could also happen. So this method is um, a compromise between the two. So I hope with the plots you got like an intuition of how these two things are combined, the prior and the likelihood, but now a little bit of math to see how this happened in reality. And these two things are combined, the prior and the likelihood, by the use of the Bayes theorem. Okay, and I'm using theta to refer to the parameter of interest. There could be a proportion, like the proportion of parents that prefer bilingual education, or could be mu the average of the population, the average of something that you want to study, or a variance, or, or it could be an effect size, anything that you want to study. Now, you may remember the base here, maybe <laughs> uh, used with events. So if you have the probability of A given B, that is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A, and all that divided by the probability of B. Well, this can also be applied to distribution and random variables. And what we are saying here is that the distribution of the parameter condition and all the data is equal to the distribution of the data condition and the parameter, that's the likelihood function, times the distribution of the parameter, and that's the prior distribution, divided by the probability of the data. Now, we can remove this probability of the data here because it does not depend on theta, the parameter of interest is not a function of theta. So for the moment, we can forget about that. And because I'm eliminated that constant, that will be a constant, I will now say that the probability of theta given the data is proportional, this time will be proportional to the likelihood function times the prior distribution. OK, so what we have in the left hand side is the posterior distribution, is the distribution of theta, the parameter on the distance, given the new data that you got, given the new evidence, and that's proportional to the likelihood times the prior. To be very rigorous here, I have to say that we need to make sure that the posterior integrates one, so it's a well-defined posterior distribution. If that's not the case, you cannot use for that case this framework for inference. So the base theorem probably when I mentioned you say, oh no, <laughs> because people tend to hate it. And in fact, you maybe have read in the Guardian newspapers a couple of weeks ago uh, talking about the base theorem of the obscure math theorem that is dominating all the decisions regarding the, the COVID. OK, so now I want to unveil the obscure math theorem and present this problem in a different way, which hopefully uh, will help you to understand this. So let's go back to the example of the doctor and the diagnosis of breast cancer. But now instead of talking about probabilities, I will talk about numbers because people are more used 
to numbers than to probabilities. So let's say that 10 out of a thousand women in the 40s have breast cancer. Okay. Now, from those 10 women that have breast cancer, if they do a mammogram, nine of them will test positive. Not a lot of them because the positive, um, the true positive rate is not 100%. Unfortunately, tests tend to be more and more accurate, but they are not perfect. Right? If you do a COVID test, maybe come as positive and you don't have COVID. Right? So, or maybe you have COVID and the test has not detected this. So, from those 10 women that have breast cancer, nine will test positive. So, remember, we have a thousand women, and from these thousand women, 10 have breast, can breast cancer, so 990 are healthy. They do not have breast cancer. But if they do a mammogram, 89 of them will have a positive mammogram because there is a false positive rate. Sometimes will come up positive and you don't have cancer, right? The, the false positive rate is small, is 9%, and that means that from 990 women that do not have cancer, 89 will still test positive. And now, I think this is the last question for you. <laughs> How many of these women with a positive mammogram actually have breast cancer? How many of all the women that tested positive have breast cancer? And I'll see your answers in the chat. Good. I'm seeing good answers. <laughs> so 98 is the total women that tested positive. The 89 plus the 9. I think you can still see the slides with the information there. But the question is from them, how many actually have breast cancer? Because we know that sometimes the test can positive when they don't have cancer. And most of the times the test does well. <laughs> But sometimes it fails. Perfect. That's what I wanted to see. <laughs> you see, like how with a little trick, now you are more aware about this uh, Bayes theorem. How does it work? So there were 98 women that tested positive. That is the 89 that were healthy but still tested positive, plus this nine. Okay, 98 tested positive. But from this, only nine have breast, breast cancer. So the proportion is 9%. This is the same question at the beginning, which most of the doctors got it wrong, but now presented uh, with numbers rather than probability, most of them got it right. So the same people that did the analysis, that wrote this book and did these questions with probabilities to the doctor, they did the same question as I did for you with numbers to other 24 doctors, and most of them got the correct answer as you did. So the problem here, or what you need to be aware, yeah, is the, the true positive rate is very high and the false positive rate is very small, but you cannot forget that most of the women do not have breast cancer. So if you are testing all of them, you will have a lot of women that are healthy and are still testing positive. So when you go to the doctor, maybe you go to the doctor uh, because you have other symptoms, uh, you have touched your cell and you found some, something hard there, and then the probability will be higher. But here we are ignoring all that. We are just thinking that every woman of that age is tested and and what is the probability that if your test comes positive, you actually have breast cancer, all right? Uh, 
there are a lot of now false positives with COVID because we are testing everybody. We are not just testing people with with symptoms, which will be a biased selection of the people who is getting the test. We are testing everybody, right? Okay, I'm very happy with that. But in case that is still not clear, <laughs> I will suggest you this book, Bayesian Probability for Babies. That I actually have it here. Yeah. <laughs> And that I bought for my daughter. <laughs> and the book is very nice and it's talking about biscuits. Some biscuits have sweets, others do not have. And we have a little piece of a biscuit here. And we want to know what is the probability that comes from a biscuit with candies or a biscuit without sweets. Well, with the information that we have so far, it looks like it's more likely that will come from the biscuits um, without sweets, because any bite that you will take here will come a bite without, without sweets. Instead here, I think this is the only bite that will come without sweets, all the bites will come with sweets. But there is something that I haven't told you yet, and is how many biscuits we have in our jar. Right, I imagine that most of the big biscuits have sweets. Then I'm sure that will change your estimation about what is the probability that this will come from a plain biscuit or a biscuit with sweets. <laughs> right, I'll look back to the slides. Good, so how do we use the Bayes theorem? How do we apply it? How, how do we actually get the posterior distribution? It looks like a nice idea. I have the prior information, I have the new data. I want to combine these two to update my knowledge and have a new posterior distribution about the parameters. So how can we get that? Well, there are different ways. One is analytically, that means mathematically, doing the math behind it and very quickly, very quickly. <laughs> so you see, it's, it's not magic. I have a little model here, the model that we were using for the bilingual education. So the likelihood function is binomial. Parents either prefer bilingual or monolingual education. And the parameter which of interest, which is the proportion here, is being modeled, the prior distribution by a beta distribution. And these A, B are the parameters of the beta distribution, and they are called the hyperparameters. We need to specify this. The values of A and B will depend on what do we know about this proportion. The value of A and B will determine what is the center of this beta. Maybe my prior knowledge think that the proportion of people that prefer bilingual education is around 0.5, or maybe my prior knowledge say that it's about 0.7, or maybe it says that it's about 0.3. So that prior knowledge that I have will determine what is the value of A and B. Right, but this is the prior distribution. Now the Bayes theorem says that the posterior distribution, the distribution of the parameter given the data, is proportional to the likelihood in red here times the prior in blue here. So now you will be horrorized when I show you the math there, <laughs> but this is just the function of the binomial distribution. This is the likelihood function, and in blue, this is the beta distribution. Maybe you have seen or you remember how the function for the normal distribution is. Well, here I have the binomial distribution and the beta distribution. I will not go into details. I'm removing some parts from this which do not depend on the parameter because I'm only computing this up to a level of proportionality. It's proportional to this. So I will focus on the important parts or the core parts of this distribution. So I will simplify this expression here. And now GSEC uh, mathematics here. We have theta to the power of x in this term, and we have theta to the power of a minus one. This is the multiplication of two power functions with the same base. That is equal to a new power function with the same base, and the power is the sum of these two. So I'll combine this theta to x with this theta to a minus one, 
in just this first term here, theta to x plus a minus 1. And I will do the same with the other power function that has a space 1 minus theta. That's all the math. So now if I look at what I got, I got something that has the same shape as the beta distribution, which is here in blue. Theta to some exponent minus 1 and 1 minus theta to something minus 1. So here I have theta to a new something minus 1 and 1 minus theta to a new something minus 1. So the posterior distribution in this case is a beta distribution, it's the same family as the prior, but with updated parameters. The new parameter that before I call a here in the posterior is x plus a and n minus a, x plus b. Now remember that x is counting the, the parents that prefer bilingual education. Let's call this the success. And n minus x will be the parents that prefer monolingual education. So that means that this a and b, the parameters that I have in my prior distribution, you can think on these hyperparameters when you're choosing your prior as the prior number of success. If you have a previous study about this, it may be the previous number of parents that prefer bilingual education, that would be a, and the previous number of parents that prefer monolingual education, that would be b. So that's how we do the math. Let's just show you. Believe me, this is a simple example <laughs> there. But unfortunately, or for you probably fortunately, we don't always can compute this analytically. It's in very few cases, this can be done analytically in simple models with simple distribution. But as the model becomes more and more complex, it's more difficult to be able to do it analytically. So then we rely on numerical methods. We will apply some algorithms in particular Markham chain Monte Carlo algorithms to obtain a sample from the posterior distribution. So rather than a mathematical expression, we will get a sample of values for this parameter that come from the true posterior distribution. And there are different algorithms I just mentioned here. In case you're interested, you can then look on this further, but I, I will not go into detail for that. Now, if you are applying this approximate method, you really need to check that they have converged, that the sample that you're getting has converged to the posterior distribution that you are approximating. And there are different ways to do this. So what I'm doing here is plotting the trace of this, this sample values that I'm getting. And actually I'm plotting two different trays with different initial values because it's a formulation. And there is an horizontal line in black and red that you cannot see which are the mean values and they match very well in the red and the black case. So that means that the posterior mean is stable and uh, the sample that you got has converged to the posterior distribution. And this is the, the posterior distribution from this sample. This is a case of conversion. And in the bottom, you will see a case where there is still not conversion. These two change the black and red uh, still behave differently. And you can also see that the posterior is quite irregular, which can be an also an indication of lack of conversion. Just make you aware that you need to check conversion if you are using some MCMC algorithm. And if you are using software packages that apply this algorithm for you, so you don't need to write yourself the algorithm, and you just use some software for that, for that, you need to make sure that you are checking Converging. There are other cases of conjugacy, and these are nice cases. These are cases when, given the prior that you're choosing for the parameters and the likelihood of your data, in some cases, the posterior belongs to the same family as the prior, as the beta binomial model that we just saw. If that is the case, we say this is a case of conjugacy, and there are many examples of this. I'm just listing some of them. So you, if your data is binomial and your prior is beta, your posterior will be beta with updated parameters. If your uh, li likelihood is normal, many data has normal distribution, let's assume for now that the variance is not, so we are just focusing on estimating one parameter, the mean, and the prior distribution for that mean is normal, then the posterior will be normal and so on. If the likelihood is exponential and the prior is gamma, 
then the posterior will be gamma. And we know how the parameters are updated. So if this is the case, it's nice because you don't need to do any complex calculations or rely on approximate methods. But if you're going to use these conjugacy cases, you need to make sure that these settings, this likelihood and the prior, are appropriate for your study and that you are not just choosing this because of convenience. OK, whatever the prior and the likelihood is that you're choosing for your study, that needs to be very well justified. And finally, you can use a lot of software that are now available. I just mentioned here some of them. WinBooks, which has a very nice interface, which is you just write the model and then WinBooks does everything for you. Uh, JAX require this to be run from another model, like for example, R. I don't know if you have heard about R. STAN is newer and incorporates more algorithms or MCMC methods comparing with the others. And there are a lot of libraries and packages in R and Python that also perform Bayesian inference and compute this algorithm for you. Good, so we have three ingredients, the prior, the likelihood and the posterior. And now the question is how we do statistical inference. We want to know what is the proportion of parents that prefer bilingual education. We want to answer our research questions. And the answer is you have the distribution, the posterior distribution parameter. You can almost answer any question you want. You can compute the posterior mean if you want a point estimate, just one value, or the median if your distribution is asymmetric, or the mode, the most likely value. And Moreover, and more importantly, you can compute probabilities. So maybe you are estimating the effect of some treatment, and so you just want to know if, if the effect is positive, and you can compute the probability that your parameter is greater than zero, something that you cannot do in the frequentist approach. Maybe we want to know if most of the parents prefer the bilingual education. So I just want to know uh, if it's, that's the most preferred method of education, because if that's the case, we will um, create more bi bilingual schools. So uh, you can compute what is the probability that that proportion is greater than 0.5. Remember in the toy example that we had, we couldn't say what was the most preferred um, method of education, but in the Bayesian approach, you can compute the probability. Sometimes you have a very high probability, probability that it is greater than 0 0.5 is 90%. Sometimes it's small, okay? But you will be able to assess that statement, to attach some level of certainty or uncertainty to that statement. And finally, the credible intervals, which is a different, is different to the confidence intervals of the uh, frequentist approach. Um, here you will be able to say that the probability that your parameter lies in a given range is 90% because here the parameter is a random variable. So the probability that my parameter is between A and B, where A and B represent numbers between 10 and 20, that the proportion of parents that prefer bilingual education is between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 uh, is equal to the 95% if that's the level that you prefer to use. Now, one thing, there are many 95% credible intervals that you can construct from a posterior distribution. Let me show you just some. Remember that the area under the whole density function is one. So now if you want a 95% uh, credible intern, you could choose, for example, the area that here I have shaded represents 95% and the confidence interval will be here from 6.3 to 100%. There is a probability of 95% that theta is between 6.3 and 100%. But instead of that one, maybe I could have chosen this one because this area is also 95%. So the probability that theta is between 0 and 58% is 95 percent. Okay, so where to choose it? It depends on your research questions. The two more commonly used type of credible intervals are the central 
or percentile posterior interval, and that will be centered in the middle. So each of the tails will have the other 5% in equal sizes, so 2.5 on the right, 2.5 on the left. And the other one is called the highest posterior density interval. From all those possible 95% confidence intervals that you could create, you will choose the one who is the narrowest. And these are examples of these two. Uh, the first one is the center of percentile credible interval, and the second one is the highest posterior density. I won't enter into much detail because we're running out of time, but I just want to say if the distribution is more or less symmetric, they won't differ much, and you can see that these two cases, they don't differ much, these two, but if it's very skewed with a very long tail to either size or bimodal or multimodal, then there will be very big differences, like for example here. The highest posterior density credible interval in the bottom here is not continuous, it involves two little ranges, which is very different to the credible interval on the top. So what I have after this is a series of examples uh, from different papers, which I think is five to six. I think I will now go through that. Uh, slides will be available, so you can just take a look. And there was an example about regression, how to use patient regression, etc. I will just go to the end. where I again uh, list similarities and differences, but I add, I add some of them as we have progressed with, with the talk. So the difference in how we define probability, uh, the incorporation of the prior knowledge of the Bayesian framework. Uh, large samples are needed, usually in the frequentist approach, are not needed um, in the Bayesian approach, you can assume or use any likelihood function as you want. In the Bayesian approach, the parameter is fixed, is unknown and fixed, and the data is what is random, while in the Bayesian approach, the parameter is random and the data is fixed. We have seen the different ways to quantify uncertainty between these two approaches, and we have seen two different types of construct intervals for your parameter, the confidence intervals and the credible intervals. So just to summarize, this is the last slide I promise. Uh, some of the advantages of the Bayesian framework would be that it has more intuitive interpretation. People tend to interpret confidence interval as probability, but that's wrong. That's correct in the Bayesian approach, and there is a lot of research of these misinterpretations in scientific publications. It does not require hypothesis testing. We don't need to assume any value and test over and over again the same hypothesis have the whole distribution, you can evaluate any probability that you want. It has a better quantification of uncertainty, so the distribution, in particular when the models start to be complex and you have, for example, different levels, etc. In the frequentist approach, you may require a two-step uh, of inference in different stages. You first estimate some parameters, then you plug in this in your next equation and estimate again, and you are um, underestimating the uncertainty if that is the case. In, in the Bayesian framework, they will all be taken into account. In the Bayesian framework, you can incorporate previous knowledge, which I think is more in accordance with how science progresses, and it can handle small samples and doesn't require the normality of some as, uh, assumption of normality. What are the limitations? Well, in some cases, the result depends strongly on the prior distribution. So if you are using a very informative prior, this needs to be very well justified. And when you are not sure which prior distribution you, to use, you can do a sensitive analysis, that is to repeat your study under different priors and compare. There are the worst example of this that I have skipped now here, how the, the selection of the prior distribution impact on the results. Sometimes it doesn't impact much, so your results are robust. And if it does impact much, then it needs to be clearly uh, justified. And it requires more computational time when you're using these approximate methods. This has been a little bit overcome now with the development of the technology, the improvement of the, of the computers, etc. but it's still there. If you want to know more about Bayesian, there are some books here 
and a long list of references that I have used for this talk. And thank you very much. 